Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to For Fox Sake, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen and my still slightly sick co-host who needs to keep her germs out of our recording studio and is again recording with me through Skype is Katie. Hey guys, still kind of sick. It's great. That being said, let's just fly into the Phoenix flashback. Last week we covered the first half of chapter 24, Occlumency, and the absolutely no corresponding film scenes. Creature is acting more suspicious than usual, even for him. Harry is excellent at meddling, but not so great with context clues. Snape and Sirius's desire to continuously snipe at each other comes very close to overshadowing Arthur's homecoming. Stan Shunpike, true to character, has zero chill, but then again, neither do any members of the DA. Ron's first trip on the night bus has him wishing he'd called a fluber instead. And Cho is as thirsty as Harry is clueless. A match made in heaven. Or hormones. During episode 160, Snape sneers sneerily. Our Potter pondering was, What are your thoughts on how the movie didn't include the detail that Creature went missing for a while? Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Megan calling in my Potter pondering. So, of course, my feelings about the details of Creature being left out, my feeling is that that's not how it happened in the book. I am very frustrated by the details with Creature that were left out and the details with Dobby that were left out and the fact that Winky was left out entirely. They did the house elves a huge disservice in the movies. As for the additional pondering, if I had to choose between nightmares and extra lessons with Snape, I would choose the extra lessons with Snape because even though he kind of sucks, I loved school and I would love having extra lessons, um, even though it was Snape, so it wouldn't be as fun. But still, that's probably what I would pick because nightmares are really scary and you can never seem to do anything in your nightmares. You can never actually scream or fight, but I'm ranting. And then the other thing with Harry's nightmares is that they're usually real. So that I feel like just adds a whole other level of terror to those nightmares. Thanks. Hey guys, here's my pot of pondering for this week. This is just becoming a recurring thing now. I hated that we didn't have creature disappearing because not only was it a big part of this book but it also i think it sort of led into when we started to pity creature you know in the next book and even at the end of this book too you know it led to that and we also didn't get that in movie six so one left out thing leads to another and as for my bonus pondering yeah i'd rather have the nightmares Snape might have died on the side of good, but I still don't like him, and I would much rather have nightmares than the way he teaches Occlumency. Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Ashley with this week's Potter Pondering. What are my feelings about the movie leaving out Cratchit's little special vacation? And would I rather have nightmares or kick it with Snape? I do feel some type of way about them leaving anything out of the movies, but hey, couldn't be helped, I guess. But this one is forgivable to me, just because out of all the house elves depicted in the movies, Crutcher is the most developed. Sorry, not sorry. His story gets told, and even without knowing about his little special vacation to the Mount Floyds, we still know about Crutcher, and he has character development in the next movie, slash book. What about Winky? What about Winky? That's how I feel. To me, this was just kind of giving you insight about what house elves are capable of and how there are ways to kind of circumvent the enchantment, as I believe, that is on them that kind of 
binds them to these other magical families. How they can have orders, take the orders, and have rules that they kind of have to abide by and find little loopholes and ways around them. Like, how the fuck y'all think Dobby was able to just kick it at the dirt sleeves for 30 minutes, beating his own ass? Since he thought that that was good enough for him, that's why it was able to work. He believed that was punishment for him to do that, and he believed it, so that's why it worked. But yeah, those are my thoughts. Now, on the nightmares or Snape, obviously, if I was Harry, nightmares, because fuck Snape. And Harry, I don't think he wanted to have the nightmares, but I think he wanted to explore them. Harry, in his weird curiosity self, he wanted to see what that shit was about. He wanted to dig deeper, and I don't even think he wanted to stop him, honestly. But me, Ashley? Oh, I'm going to go kick it with Snape. Like, teach me the stuff. I don't care about your bad attitude or dislike or however you feel about whatever. I want to learn the powerful magics that other kids don't know about. Tell me. Teach me. I want to be able to do it, and I want to be a badass at it. Like, that's how I am in real life. Like, nurses' attitudes all the time, just being just straight up funky people, that's fine. That's fine. It is a shortage out here. Bring your ass to work and help. And you can help mad. I don't care. We just need help. Help us. But yes, those are my thoughts. Good night, guys. Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was... What hex does Harry produce to ward off Snape the first time he casts Legilimens on him? Harry accidentally produces a stinging hex that causes Snape to stop his attempt to penetrate his mind. Penetrate. I put that in there specifically so you could say it. To penetrate his mind. (laughs) There we go. Congratulations goes to Megan Slater. Woohoo! This is week one. Will she be restarting her streak? Well, who knows? Hard to say since Mike was right behind her with a backup answer in case she got it wrong, which she didn't. (laughs) But who's going to answer it first this week? We shall see. For now, let's dive into the second half of Chapter 24, Occlumency, and the most basic of corresponding film scenes. Chapter 24, Occlumency, Part 2. By six o'clock that evening, even the glow of asking out Cho Chang dims with every step Harry takes towards Snape's office. He pauses at the door, wishing he was anywhere else but there, but then knocks and enters the shadowy room, lined with shelves bearing hundreds of glass jars containing various bits of animals, plants, and potions. There is also a cabinet full of potion ingredients— but Harry's eye is drawn to a shallow stone basin engraved with runes and symbols. He immediately recognizes it as Dumbledore's pensive and wonders why it's there. His thoughts are interrupted by Snape's cold voice, telling him to close the door. As Harry does so, Snape continues speaking, reminding him that he's there to learn occlumency and adding on that he only hopes he proves more adept at it than potions. In response to Harry's terse right, Snape tells Harry that it may not be an ordinary class, but he is still to call him sir or professor at all times. Harry gives him a yes sir, and Snape returns to the topic of occlumency, explaining that it is a branch of magic that seals the mind against magical intrusion and influence. Harry wants to know why Dumbledore wants him to learn it, and though he comments that he thinks he should have been able to work it out for himself, Snape does inform Harry that the Dark Lord is highly skilled at legilimency. Harry asks what that is, and is horrified to realize that Voldemort can read minds, though Snape gives him a hard time for not understanding that it is much more complex than mind reading, as the mind is many-layered. Mastering legilimency allows witches and wizards to delve into the minds of their victims and interpret their findings correctly, and only those skilled at occlumency are able to shut those feelings and memories down to protect themselves. Harry thinks that still sounds like mind reading, and wonders if that means Voldemort could know what they are thinking now. Snape explains that between distance, the protection around Hogwarts, and the fact that eye contact is often necessary to legilimency, that it is unlikely, 
which makes Harry wonder why he needs to learn Occlumency. Snape explains that the usual rules don't seem to apply to him because the curse that failed to kill him seems to have forged a connection between him and the Dark Lord, and when his mind is most relaxed and vulnerable, like when he's asleep, he shares the Dark Lord's thoughts and emotions. Dumbledore doesn't think it's a good idea for that to go on and wishes Harry to learn how to close his mind. Harry doesn't understand why, since it's been pretty useful helping to save Mr. Weasley, but Snape explains that until that vision, the Dark Lord remained ignorant of the connection. Harry questions how that's possible since he saw the snake's head, not Voldemort's, and Snape snaps at him not to say the Dark Lord's name. They glare at each other over the pensive, and Harry quietly reminds him that Dumbledore says his name. Snape mutters in return that Dumbledore is a powerful wizard and may feel secure enough using his name, and he trails off while unconsciously rubbing his left forearm, which Harry knows is where the dark mark has burned into his skin. Harry forces his voice back to politeness to ask about the snake again, and this time Snape explains that he seems to have visited the snake's mind because that's where the Dark Lord was at that moment. Harry then asks about Voldemort realizing he was there, and wonders how they know that he knows. At this point, Snape seems to be done answering Harry's question, and tells him that it's enough that they know, and now they are concerned that he might use the connection in reverse to access Harry's thoughts and emotions, which brings them back to Occlumency. He pulls his wand out of his robes and places it to his temple to draw some silvery substance from it and lower it into the pensive. With no other explanation, he repeats this process two more times and then carefully moves the basin from between them before standing with his wand at the ready, facing Harry. Snape tells him to get his wand out and use it to disarm him or for defense in any way he can. Harry asks his professor what he's going to do and Snape informs him that he's going to attempt to break into his mind to see how well he resists. He also mentions Harry's aptitude for resisting the Imperious Curse and tells him that similar powers are needed for this. He then tells Harry to brace himself and calls Legilimens. Harry doesn't have any time to resist, and the office vanishes as he is bombarded with image after image of his memories. Jealousy over Dudley riding his new bike, being chased into a tree by Aunt Marge's bulldog ripper, putting on the sorting hat and hearing he'd do well in Slytherin, Hermione in the hospital wing covered in black hair, a hundred Dementors drawing closer, and Cho Chang drawing nearer under the mistletoe. The last memory prompts Harry to find himself, wanting to protect that private memory, and he feels a pain in his knee and Snape's office returns as he realizes he fell to the floor, colliding with the leg of Snape's desk. He looks up at the professor and sees an angry wheel on his wrist, which Snape is rubbing. He asks if Harry meant to produce a stinging hex, and Harry gives him a very bitter no as he stands back up. Snape tells him that he thought not, saying he lost control and let him get in too far. Harry asks if Snape saw everything he did, and he explains that he saw flashes, cruelly wondering who the dog belonged to. Harry mutters, my Aunt Marge, in response, and Snape brings the topic back to their lesson again, letting Harry know that for a first attempt, it wasn't as poor as it could have been. He instructs him not to waste time shouting and to remain focused, repelling him with his brain so he won't need his wand. Harry angrily tells him that he's trying, but Snape isn't telling him how. The potions master reminds him to use manners, but then asks him to close his eyes and try to clear his mind, letting go of all emotion. Despite these instructions, Harry's anger towards Snape holds on for the rest of the lesson, making it extremely easy for Snape to access his memories and basically hand him weapons to use. As Harry stands back up, heart thumping, after reliving Cedric's death, he notices that even Snape looks paler than usual as he angrily tells Harry that he isn't making any effort and emptying himself of emotion. Harry snarls that he's finding that hard at the moment and Snape savagely says that he will find himself easy prey for the Dark Lord, that fools who wear their hearts on their sleeves and cannot control their emotions are weak 
and easily provoked and stand no chance against his powers. Harry insists that he isn't weak, and Snape snaps back for him to prove it and to master himself. A barrage of more memories sweep over him again, and when he sees himself and Mr. Weasley running along a windowless passage, he recognizes the plain black door at the end of the corridor and realizes it is the same door he has been dreaming about. Snape wants to know what happened, but instead of explaining, Harry just asks him about the Department of Mysteries. This unnerves Snape, who wants to know why Harry is asking. Watching closely for his reaction, Harry tells his professor that he's been dreaming about that corridor for months, and he thinks Voldemort wants something from it. Snape yells at Harry for saying the Dark Lord's name again, and then plainly tells him that there are many things in the Department of Mysteries, but none of them concern him. He then demands Harry come back the same time on Wednesday to continue their work, and dismisses him with the instructions to rid his mind of all emotion every night before sleep, warning Harry that he will know if he does not practice. Harry mumbles a response and grabs his bag before hurrying out. He glances back to see Snape returning his thoughts to his head and closes the door, his scar throbbing. He finds Ron and Hermione at the library and sits down by them, feeling almost feverish. Hermione asks how it went, then, looking concerned, asks if Harry is all right. He says he's fine and fills them in on what he just realized about the Department of Mysteries. Ron asks if the thing you know who was after is at the Ministry of Magic, and Harry whispers back that it's got to be. Hermione sighs and says, of course, before reminding them about Sturgis Podmore trying to get through a door at the Ministry, and Ron wants to know why he would be trying to break in if he was on their side. Hermione doesn't know, and Harry asks Ron if his dad has ever mentioned anything about the Department of Mysteries. All Ron knows is that the people who work there are called unspeakables, and though he thinks it's a weird place to hide a weapon, Hermione thinks it makes sense because it could be something top secret the Ministry is developing. She then again asks Harry if he's sure he's all right, and Harry again says he's fine, he just doesn't like Occlumency much. She sympathetically expresses that anyone would feel shaky after having their mind repeatedly attacked, and suggests they return to the Gryffindor common room to be more comfortable. Unfortunately, back in the Gryffindor Tower, Fred and George are demonstrating their latest merchandise, headless hats. Fred places a pointed hat with a fluffy pink feather onto his head, and both it and his head vanish, causing onlookers to scream and roar with laughter. Hermione finds this to be rather clever, though doesn't expect the charm will last long. Harry doesn't answer, still feeling ill, and instead just says he will have to do his work tomorrow. Hermione tells him to write it in his planner so he doesn't forget, and Harry does, scribbling it down as the book says, Don't leave it till later, you big second raider. He crosses the room, dodging George as he tries to put a headless hat on him, and barely makes it to his dormitory before he is hit with an extremely severe wave of pain in his scar. He can hear maniacal laughter ringing in his ears and feels even happier than he has been in a long time. All of a sudden, someone is yelling his name and he comes to. The insane laughter is punctuated with a cry of pain as someone hits him around the face and Harry realizes that he is the one laughing. He's laying on the floor with Ron bending over him looking concerned. Ron asks what happened and Harry sits up saying he doesn't know but he's really, really happy. Ron asks if he means you know who, and Harry continues explaining that something good has happened, something he has been hoping for. These words are coming out of Harry's mouth like someone else is speaking them, but he knows they are true. He takes deep breaths, trying not to vomit on Ron, feeling as ill as he did after the snake dream, and grateful that Seamus and Dean aren't there watching this too. Ron tells Harry that Hermione said to check on him since his mind was likely to be vulnerable after his lesson. He adds on that he supposes it will help in the long run, but doesn't look like he really believes that as he helps Harry to bed. Harry nods, feeling like his mind is weaker rather than stronger, and wonders, with concern, what happened to make Voldemort so happy. 
This movie section picks up right after Severus arrives in Dumbledore's office at his request. It starts with Snape pulling an upset Harry by his hand down the spiral stone staircase. A J-cut overlays Snape's voice as the camera shows an aerial view of them hurrying down the stairs, telling Harry that it appears there is a connection between the Dark Lord's mind and his own. The scene cuts to Harry sitting in a chair in Snape's office as he continues explaining that the Dark Lord may not know about this connection, and to pray that he remains ignorant. Harry asks if he will be able to read Harry's mind if he knows about it, and Snape clarifies that he will be able to read it, control it, and unhinge it. He explains that in the past, the Dark Lord often invaded minds and created visions to torture people into madness before finally killing them. As Harry gazes up at Snape in fear, the Potions Master continues speaking, telling Harry that occlumency, when used properly, will help shield him from access or influence. He explains that he is going to give him extra lessons where he will attempt to penetrate Harry's mind as Harry attempts to resist. Without any other warning, Snape tells Harry to prepare himself and steps back as he points his wand and calls out Legilimens. Harry sees flashes of memories, arriving at Grimmauld Place, the Dementor attack, Hermione hugging him, the DA meetings, encounters with Dudley, and his dream of Voldemort before Snape tells him to concentrate and focus. As Harry struggles in the chair against the mental onslaught, the camera zooms out of the window and up into the dark, snowy sky overlooking the castle before fading into white. The fuck was that, Ellen? Yeah, it definitely ties into this chapter, or this half of the chapter, I should say. However, weird because we had to take it from a different part. I say we're backtracking quite a bit. But it's so weird that that's the part the movie decided to put it in at. Mm-hmm. It's just all around weird. Yeah. Because this half of the book chapter starts out right after he manages to ask out Cho Chang and is feeling pretty good about himself. Oh, yeah, he's feeling like a big man. But the closer and closer and closer it gets to his first Occlumency lesson with Snape, the worse and worse and worse he feels. Like you do when you have extra lessons with Snape. Right? <laughs> so even though he's kind of riding the Cho Chang high, it dims and dims and dims with every step he takes towards Snape's office. Yep. Comes six o'clock. He arrives, hesitates at the door, but then knocks and opens it. We've seen Snape's office before. I think we definitely saw a storeroom. Maybe that wasn't his office. I feel like that might have been like an offshoot of his office. Yeah. You know, like the storeroom was connected to his office, maybe? Because it was right off of the corridor. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that was the student one? Who knows? Who knows? But in the movie, we've definitely seen something, and we're about to actually see it for real, too, in this scene. Mm-hmm. But this is the first time that it's really been fully described in the books. Mm-hmm. So it mentions that it's a shadowy room, which makes sense for Snape. Sure. Lined with shelves, got a whole bunch of glass jars that's got bits of animals, plants, all floating in potions and stuff. So things for potions, I'm sure. Actual potions that have been made. Sounds like a pretty basic science lab. Yeah. It's an apothecary. Yeah. I dig it. There's also a cabinet full of potion ingredients. So this could be like that cupboard. Mm-hmm. But what Harry notices above everything else is something that is not normally in there, and that is a shallow stone basin engraved with runes and symbols. And it looks very familiar to him because it's Dumbledore's pensive. Well, look at that. And he's like, why is this here? Because he's a meddler. <laughs> right. He can't just see something and be like, oh, that's a thing. <laughs> right. But before he can even ask about it or think any further on it, Snape speaks up to tell him to close the door, which he does. And Snape continues talking, telling him that he's there to learn occlumency and that he only hopes he proves more adept at it than he does at potions because he can't just say, hey, welcome to your occlumency lesson. Yeah, because that's too easy to be, like, supportive. Right? <laughs> Harry gives a very terse right. Because what else do you say? Right, yeah. I almost said right, but <laughs> yeah. Right. Occlumency. Got it. And Snape reminds Harry that this is not a normal class, but I am still your professor, and you will address me as Professor or Sir, which 
honestly, kind of fair. Kind of fair. Also gives kind of like some daddy dom vibes, but whatever. <laughs> That's That's just cuz it's you. Oh, is that what it is? Yes. <laughs> I was what I thought it was following me, but no, apparently it's just the vibe I bring. Okay. <laughs> So this time Harry gives him a yes, sir. But I feel like he did it with sarcasm. I feel like he did it as a, like an impersonation of Snape. Yes, sir. sir. It does have <laughs> yes, dot, 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 sir in yeah. the book. <laughs> there is literally the hesitation there. Yeah. So Harry puts on his best Alan Rickman impression. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yes. <laughs> Sir. And so Snape accepts this and returns to the topic of Occlumency, telling him that it's a branch of magic that will seal the mind against magical intrusion and influence. So it's just like a mind shield. Yeah. A mental mind shield. Yeah, it's kind of like a mental Patronus, almost. Yeah, definitely. But like you can use it against more than just Dementors. Dementals? Demen yes, Dementals. <laughs> Harry is still really caught up on why he has to learn it. And Snape just tells him that he would have thought he could have figured this out by now. But apparently he's not taking into consideration the fact that Harry is not a Ravenclaw. No. Even though that really hasn't been something anyone has had to convince Snape of in the past, for sure. Right? More likely he just really wanted to work that little insult in there. Because he does let him know that the Dark Lord is highly skilled at legilimency. Yeah. Which is a new word for Harry, because he says what? LOL, what? <laughs> new word for all of us, fuck. Right? <laughs> and Snape kind of explains what it is, and Harry says, you mean Voldemort can read minds? <laughs> and I always thought this is kind of funny, because he specifically calls it reading minds, and Snape says, it's a little bit more complex than that, only muggles speak of reading mind like it's a book. And he tries to explain that the mind is many-layered, and... Mastering legilimency will allow witches and wizards to delve into the minds and they can feel the feelings and hear their thoughts and interpret what they find. He's trying to explain the complexity of it by using more words and Harry's just like, yeah, that's mind reading, man. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Except he's not dumb enough to say that out loud. So basically, this is mind reading. That's all I'm getting here, guy. Right. Right. And I just think it's kind of funny that in the movie, they still just flat out say, yes, it's mm -hmm. mind reading. They add a little bit more on that. But yeah, it's mind reading. Yeah, they throw a little bit more in. But I mean, bro, it's mind reading. Right. Snape just likes to overcomplicate things because it's Snape. He can. Yeah. He's like those people that like use really fancy words to make themselves sound smarter than they are. I mean, he is really smart. No, he is very smart, but, like, he's pompous about it. He is definitely pompous about it, because it is mind-reading. He's just going into the complexities that is mind-reading. Yeah. Like, yes, okay, it's a lot of stuff, but basically all that stuff you just said is encapsulated in the words mind-reading. Which does perhaps oversimplify it, but... It gets the point across. Yeah. And basically, Harry needs to learn occlumency because that is the only way you can shut down those feelings and memories to protect yourself. Yeah. But like we said, still just mind reading. And Harry wonders if Voldemort could know what they're thinking right now. Which I think is actually a legit question. Yeah. Like, oh shit, Voldy can read minds? Does he know what I'm thinking right now? How unsafe are we? Yeah. Which, I mean, on one hand, a very valid point. However, I'm kind of intrigued at the idea that Harry didn't think that Voldy could read minds before. That just seems like par for the course for him. Like, I wasn't right. shocked to find out that Voldemort could do this. Well, as we've mentioned, not in Ravenclaw. True. This is really the first time it's ever been brought up to him, and I just don't think it's something he would think about beforehand. Very true. And Snape does tell him that with how far the Dark Lord is away from them, the fact that there's all sorts of protections around Hogwarts, and that eye contact is often really necessary for legilimency, that it's very unlikely the Dark Lord could actually 
get into their minds at this point. Mm-hmm. So Harry's just like, well, why do I need to learn Occlumency then? Yeah. What are we doing all this shit for? This is basically where the movie section comes in, even if it's actually plucked from an earlier section of the movie. You know, back in Dumbledore's office before Christmas, mind you, you'll remember (laughs) that Snape showed up and Dumbledore was all like, oh yeah, not a minute to waste because we're all vulnerable and things are about to get fucked up, you know? Yep. Well, we join back with this as Snape drags Harry down a stone spiral staircase by his arm like a fucking toddler. Like, dude, just let him follow you, man. He's coming. Just Or, you know, don't do this scene at this point at all. Movie. Well, there's that, too. Ew, David. Ew, David. As they're going down the stairs, we hear Snape tell Harry that there seems to be a connection between Voldy's brain and his, which means... When you think dirty thoughts, the Dark Lord can probably see them as well, so quit being a little pervy, sicko. (laughs) Just saying. Yes, because that's Harry's main issue right there. Yes, obviously. That's every 15-year-old boy's main issue. Yeah, so aside from the fact that that's not how it happened in the book, or I should say that's not when it happened in the book. That too, definitely. It's at least kind of what happened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he doesn't get dragged from Dumbledore's office. It gets set up ahead of time. But he does explain the connection there. Yeah. That's what actually happens in the book, too, because Snape just flat out says the usual rules don't really seem to apply to Harry, which I love that he worded it that way because he's always bitching about the fact that Harry gets special treatment, that the rules don't seem to apply to him. Right? Honest to God. It's just a thing. (laughs) He is so salty about Harry and his fucking, like, ability to skirt the rules. Right. But this is interesting to me, too, because this is the most information that I think anybody has given Harry about his scar and the connection between him and Voldemort yet. Yeah. Because Snape just flat out tells him that the curse that failed to kill him seems to have built this connection between them that when Harry is most relaxed and vulnerable, like when he's sleeping, Mm -hmm. allows him to share feelings and emotions and thoughts with the Dark Lord. It's like a brain tunnel, if you will. It's like a mental cup from one ear to the other. (laughs) Yes. With a string. Tin can with strings. Yes. (laughs) He also tells him that Dumbledore doesn't think it's a good idea for this to keep happening. And that's why he wants Harry to learn how to close his mind. What? You're telling me that that's not a good thing? And that's fair. Unless you look at it from the meddler's perspective, which is the fact that he can see into the Dark Lord's mind. Right? And that's been pretty useful, even though he doesn't really like it much. He'd Mm -hmm. never be able to save Mr. Weasley if that weren't there. That is true. And also, hello, it allows him so much more meddling power. It really does. How would he ever be able to give that up? And meddling power that nobody else has but him. Right. It definitely makes him extra special. Yeah. At this point, Snape tells him that until he had that vision about Mr. Weasley... The Dark Lord had no idea that that connection actually existed, Mm -hmm. which is when it starts to become a little bit more dangerous, though Harry is still focusing on the fact that he's not in Ravenclaw and doesn't understand why that happened because he saw the snake's mind, not Voldemort's mind. At least that's what he thought. Yeah. And this is so funny to me, too, because Snape's been saying Dark Lord the whole time. And Harry's just like, but I was in the snake's mind, not in Voldemort's. And Snape's like, don't say the Dark Lord's name. Sir. And I love that. I think that's really indicative of who Snape is in a lot of ways. Yeah. Because as brave as he comes across and to be the spy that he is. Yeah. He's clearly scared of him. Still a bit of a bitch. Yeah. He's got his reasons for going against him but that doesn't mean he's not like scared shitless i mean he also has good reasons to be scared shitless because he is going against him well yes i just think it's interesting yeah the movie however sets all this up a bit differently what i know you're shocked just calm down calm down ellen damn just chill out 
Because we then see Harry sitting in a chair as Snape gathers a bunch of what looks like torture materials. Which, side note, the fuck? All he uses is a wand. Like, he unravels like an archaeologist's fucking bag full of some shit. (laughs) Dramatic effect. Yeah! And then, like, he pulls out what appears to be a wand, but why wouldn't he just have his goddamn wand on him at all times? Does he have different wands for different things? Maybe he does. Is that a thing? This is my charms wand. This is my curse wand. Yeah, This is my spell wand. This is specifically for transfiguration. This one is for torturing students that I don't like. (laughs) Like, what the fuck? This is my wand that I don't take out ever unless I'm going to do something bad with it. So that way, if, like, they check my spells, it won't be on my regular wand. Yeah, shit. Can't trace it back to him if it's not on his wand. Yeah. It's like a burner wand. Maybe it is a burner wand. Maybe he legit uses a burner wand. So oh that my God, Pepto dude. Bitch Mall can't check his wand and see that he's been <gasps> teaching Harry occlumency. You guys, my mind is fucking blown. They have burner wands. <laughs> Episode title. Oh my god. Burner wands. burner wands. I didn't even think about that. Now it's like, it's all that's going through my head. But anyway, so he does all that. And he's getting out his burner wand, apparently. And he continues explaining that Voldy may not know about this link yet. And that's for the best. So we're just going to hope that Homie stays stupid. Because... You don't want him to know, basically. Right. Even though that's not how it happened in the book because he totally knows now. Yeah. If he didn't know before, he fucking knows now. Now, considering that they're going this route in the movie that he doesn't know yet or may not know yet, it does make sense to teach Harry Occlumency as quickly as possible. Sure. Before he figures it out. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, fine, whatever. It's still not how it happened in the book. No, it's not. It was not something that he had to be taught in the middle of the night. When Mr. Weasley is literally dying. Yeah, after being woken up from this fucking terrible-ass dream of his, you know, other daddy being attacked. Especially since in the book he was so sick from that. Yeah. Like, this is not the moment to put his mind in a vulnerable position. It already is. He doesn't look that good in the movie either. No. He looks like he's about ready to hurl the whole time. He's like all sweaty and he's like pale. And I mean, he's Danny Radcliffe, so he's always pale, but like (laughs) paler than usual. He's stressed out because Dumbledore won't look at him. Right. And they're like that whole thing. He's not in the right mindset to be taught something like this. Especially not by Snape. No. No. (laughs) Back in the book... Harry had just used the name Voldemort, Mm -hmm. freaked Snape out, yeah, and they're just glaring at each other over this situation, and Harry gives him a, well, Dumbledore says his name. (laughs) What are you, a bitch? Right. And Snape actually mutters a little bit, not really clearly and kind of trails off, but makes a comment about how Dumbledore's a very powerful wizard and may feel secure enough using the name, but that doesn't mean they all are. Because you're a bitch. Yeah, well, he trails off from this and he actually rubs his left forearm, which Harry knows that's where the dark mark is. I feel like Snape also knows better than most just how scary Voldemort is. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, he's seen it in person. Yeah. And he's been forced into a lot of things because he chose, as still a child with a non-fully developed brain, to follow him. Yeah. And it's not like you can just hand in your resignation from something like that. No, not at all. Just blood in, blood out kind of deal. It's like the Crips. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. I do liken the murder munchers to a gang. For sure. And Snape was absolutely one of those traumatized children that gets drawn into that because that's who they target. Mm Mm-hmm. Like I said, I have a lot of sympathy for teenage child Snape. Right. And then he turns into an FBI informant and... Basically. Yeah, goes in undercover. Yeah, for sure. He still needs all the therapy, but... Oh, yeah. Loads. (laughs) Oh, so much. Way off topic, jumping ahead several books. Yep. We'll get there. (laughs) 
Back to Harry and Snape butting heads about what to call Voldemort, a.k.a. the Dark Lord, a.k.a. you-know-who, a.k.a. he-who-must-not-be-named. A.k.a. Moldy Voldy. A.k.a. Voldemortman. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of names for him there. Yep. Tom. <laughs> After all that, Tom. <laughs> but Harry manages to get back to a semblance of politeness and asks about the snake again. Because he really wants to know, why was that a connection with Voldemort? And this time, Snape does actually tell him that he was in the snake's mind because that's where the Dark Lord was at that moment. Yeah. So he was actually visiting Voldemort's mind. It just happened to be that Voldemort's mind was currently in said snake. Yeah. Harry also wonders about Voldemort realizing he's there. Because like we said, that happened in the book, but not the movie. Mm -hmm. At this point, anyway. And he wants to know how they know that Voldemort now knows that. That's a valid question, I think. Not according to Snape, who feels pretty done answering Harry's questions at this point. Although, like I said before, he's really gotten more answers in more detail than he has from most other people. That is true. And Snape just tells him for this one that it's enough that they know, which I imagine they know because Snape knows. Yeah. Or they can figure it out with how quickly... Arthur was found. It could be that they know because Harry felt that specific hatred towards Dumbledore when he was in his office with him. Possibly. And that hatred was actually Voldemort jumping into his feelings mm -hmm. and seeing Dumbledore through Harry's eyes. True. So that could have been the giveaway, too. Very true. But basically, they know that he knows, and now they're worried he's going to use the connection in reverse to access Harry's thoughts and emotions. Use them against him in some way, and that then brings them back to Aquamancy, which is the whole reason why you're here in my office, even though I don't want you here. Full circle. We actually get a little more specific information in the movie. Just a smidgen. Because Harry questions if that means Voldy will be able to read his mind, and Snape tells him that... Getting his mind read is the least of his worries, because Voldy will turn that bitch inside out if he knows he can. Like, it's literally that pasty fuck's favorite hobby. He will mind fuck you so hard, there will be no wrinkles left in your brain. A volbotomy? <laughs> yeah, something like that. A volbotomy. But yeah, surprisingly, this does very little to assuage Harry's fears. Not that Snape was trying to do so, of course, because why would he? No. It's what? Snape. <laughs> yeah, if anything, he was trying to make him more fearful so that he would learn how to do this. Yes, like trying to motivate out of fear. Which does sometimes work. Sometimes, sure. Not with everybody. No. In the book, they're starting to get ready to start the actual process now of occlumency. And to prep for this, Snape pulls his wand out of his robes and places it to his temple to pull out some of the silvery branches. And he puts it into the pensive, does this a couple of times, not saying a word, just keeps doing it. I don't know that he needs to say a word because Harry actually knows what's happening as he's watched it before. Mm hmm At least one time at this point. Yeah. And then he just moves the basin out of their way, stands with his wand at the ready, and just looks at Harry like, all right, let's go, motherfucker. <laughs> let's do this. Shit. He tells Harry to get his wand out, and he can use it to disarm him, because he knows he knows that one, or <laughs> defense in any way that he can. Yeah. Harry's just like, what are you going to do? <laughs> and all he gets, the only instruction other than you can disarm me or do anything else. I'm just going to try and break into your mind to see what you do. I want to see how well you can resist this. Mm-hmm. This is where it gets almost weird. Where it gets almost weird? It's been pretty fucking weird. No. He tells Harry that he's heard he has an aptitude for resisting the Imperious Curse. Mm-hmm. He acknowledges that Harry is good at something. That's weird. Valid. That is quite weird. And he tells him that similar powers are needed for this. So he's just like, hey, you can resist the Imperious Curse? This is similar. Yeah. Give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Brace yourself. And he waves his wand and calls Legilimens. The movie actually kept this the same? 
The biggest difference is this is the first time Harry's learning why he is with Snape. When the book set it up before he returned to Hogwarts, not just forcing the scene to fit in before they even leave Hogwarts for the holidays. Yeah. Because why set things up? Let's just... Shoehorn it in. Let's just throw shit and see what sticks. How about that? Ew, David. So he tells Harry that Occlumency is kind of like, as we mentioned before, a brain Patronus. It shields your mind from bitches sneaking in and fucking with it. So, yay! Yay! And joy of joys, Harry will be doing these extra lessons with Snape as he tries to get into his brain and Harry tries to stop him. And, aside from how they set it up, it's a ding. It is a ding. That's kind of a big aside, but you know. Yes. <laughs> like, I don't know if anything can really be considered a ding, considering this was in an entirely different section of the movie than it is in the book. It is still Snape teaching Harry Occlumency in his office. <laughs> it's a ding in the broadest of terms. It's just out of order. It's a ganid. Are you fucking kidding me, Ellen? A ganid? Ding backwards. Oh my god, that wasn't the issue. Anyway. Without actually teaching Harry what to do at all, Snape just tells him to prepare himself like that tells him anything. And then just points his burner wand at him and shouts, Legilimens! Another word we have never heard before. Unless, of course, you've read the book. Well, who does that? Me! And me. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the book, Harry doesn't have any time to resist any of this. This whole prepare no. yourself was not, what, what, how, what, what? And he just gets hit with this spell. Yeah. And basically everything he can see in the office just disappears. And all he can see is just this flood of memories and thoughts and feelings just bombarding him. And it's. Him feeling jealous as he watches Dudley ride his new bicycle or being chased into a tree by Aunt Marge's bulldog ripper. And when he puts the sorting hat on and hears he'll do well in Slytherin or seeing Hermione in the hospital wing covered in black cat hair. The hundreds of Dementors drawing closer when he was trying to protect him and his dog father. And... Then, Cho Chang drawing closer and closer to him under the mistletoe. So, like, all really shitty memories until that last one. But that last one is actually what helps him find himself a little bit. Yeah. Because that one especially was really private. And he's just like, I'm not sharing this with Snape. And he yells, no. Yeah. Feels a pain in his knee and kind of comes back to himself in Snape's office and finds himself down on his hands and knees, realizing that he fell and collided with Snape's desk. Mm -hmm. and that's why his knee hurts. That would explain it for sure. And when he looks up at the potions professor, he sees him rubbing his wrist, which has an angry welt on it, <laughs> an angry looking red welt. Yeesh. And Snape wants to know if Harry meant to hit him with the stinging hex. Which was our trivia question. It sure was. But Harry just bitterly says no and stands back up. And Snape says, yeah, I didn't think so. You lost control. You let me get in too far. <laughs> that's what she said. Actually, that's more of a that's what he said. Uh, uh, depends. She could be pegging. Accurate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving on. Sorry. <laughs> He's like, I didn't fucking lose control. I had no idea what I was doing. Harry wants to know if Snape was able to see everything that he was seeing, and Snape kind of reassures him, almost saying that he only saw flashes of it, but also can't just fully reassure him, and snickers and asks who the dog belonged to. Yeah. And why Harry even bothered to answer this, I don't know, but he mutters that it was his Aunt Marge's dog, and then Snape just returns to their lesson again. And for another weird moment, tells Harry that for a first attempt, that wasn't as bad as it could have been. It was just like, considering the fact that I didn't give you any information on how to do this, you didn't right? completely suck. You actually ultimately were able to even stop me. Considering the fact that I did very little teaching. <laughs> 
In the movie, Harry also sees flashes of memory. So, ding. Yay. Or Ganid. Stop trying to make Ganid happen, Ellen. Ganid is not going to happen. <laughs> Moving on. Bam! We arrive at Grimmauld Place. Bam! The Dementor attack. Bam! Hermione hugs Harry. Because why not? Bam! The DA meetings. Bam! Encounters with Dudley. Bam! His dream of Voldemort. And then Snape tells Harry to focus, but doesn't, like, tell him what to focus on or how to focus. Like, he's literally just like, focus. So that was kind of similar to the book. A little bit, yeah. In that we had the bam visions, bam vision, bam vision, you know. Different visions, of course. But what we don't see is a near compliment from Snape, because why would we? Right. Instead... Harry struggles in the chair as Snape continues to seemingly torture the shit out of him without giving any instruction whatsoever. And we zoom out on an aerial view of the dungeon, and then the snow-covered spires of Hogwarts. Which is why we describe these as very basic corresponding film scenes, because that right there is where the scene ends. And the book chapter keeps on going. As it usually does, yes. Yes. <laughs> Snape actually does give some instruction at this point in the book. He tells Harry not to waste his time shouting. Mm hmm To remain focused, trying to repel him with his brain so that he doesn't even have to use his wand at all. So Harry's pretty annoyed by this because he's like, I'm trying to, but you're not telling me how to because, as we said, it's a gnid in both the book and the movie, that Snape is not actually instructing him on how to do this stuff. Yeah. Instead of, you know, actually instructing him, Snape just tells him to use manners. And then does actually say, close your eyes and try to clear your mind, letting go of all emotion. So, like I said, he gives him some instructions in this. Yeah. That being said... Minimal at best, but still better than what we got in the movie. Yeah, and way easier said than done. Mm hmm The moment somebody tells me to clear my mind, I will think of anything and everything. Oh, dude, I don't even understand when people tell you to clear your mind. I'm like, I don't know what that is. Like, all you can really do is just start going, um... Even then, I'm literally just thinking about what my voice sounds like. I literally, when I'm trying to clear my mind, just find myself thinking about how I can't think about anything. <laughs> I'll think about clearing my mind. It's just another thing to think about, though. People, a lot of times they tell me that the best thing to do with ADHD is to meditate and like clear. I'm like, I don't, that's not a thing I can do. Because all of a sudden I'm like, man, we need milk. You know what's really good? Soup. I like soup. Anything and everything. Anything, yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. And then on top of that, Harry can't stand Snape and he's totally a dick. So he's just really pissed at him. And that emotion makes it even more difficult for him to let go of anything. And it just makes it really easy for Snape to keep accessing his memories. And he yells at him again. You're just handing me weapons to use. Yeah. So, yeah, he just keeps pulling more memories attacking Harry's mind over and over again. Harry keeps falling back to the ground, getting himself back up. And by the time they get to the point where he basically has to relive Cedric's death, the thing is, because Snape is seeing all of this too, Snape just witnessed Cedric's death. Yeah. And this was one of his students too. Yeah. And the book even specifically mentions that even Snape looks paler than usual after this one. And also this goes in too with how the movie not only took out the extra shitty stuff that Snape did, but it did take out things like this as well, where you were kind of like, oh, you know, maybe it was just certain students. Do you know what I mean? Like, not that that makes it any better. No, the man needed all of the therapy and had no business being a teacher. But I think on a lot of levels, he still cared and was just afraid to show that. Yeah. And this took out even the idea that he cared in any way, shape, or form. It really did him a disservice. He was a very deep character. And then, of course, Snape can't even 
let anybody see that kind of weakness in himself. So his reaction to all of this that's been going on is to just yell at Harry for not making any effort in emptying himself of emotion. Well, yeah, because you got a mask right away. Don't let them in. Don't let them see. We are not turning this into a Disney sing-along, Ellen. Be the shitty potions master. You always have to be. <laughs> Conceal, don't feel. Don't let them know. Ellen. <laughs> Ellen. Anywho. Moving on. Harry snarls back that he's finding it very difficult to empty himself of emotion because Snape keeps pissing him off. I don't think he actually says that last part. What? It's implied. Yeah. <laughs> And because Snape has to continue pissing him off, he just tells him that he's going to find himself easy prey for the Dark Lord, specifically saying that fools who wear their hearts on their sleeves and cannot control their emotions are weak and therefore easily provoked and stand no chance against his powers. And all Harry hears out of that is he's weak. and He goes, I'm not weak. So Snape says, prove it. Master yourself. And they go for one more attempt. Sure. Hits him one more time with legilimens. And in another wave of these memories, he sees himself and Mr. Weasley running along a windowless passage. And he recognizes a plain black door at the end of the corridor. And he expects that they're going to go through it, but they go past it. Okay. And it clicks for him. He knows that door. This is the door that he's been dreaming about. And now he knows that door is in the Department of Mysteries. And he ends up yelling out, I know, I know, which makes Snape stop on his own, wanting to know what he knows. Yeah. What happened there. And instead of answering him, Harry just says, what's in the Department of Mysteries? Hmm. And he's actually kind of pleased to see that this unnerves Snape a little bit because he's got a knack for knowing things he shouldn't know. Right. And Snape's just kind of like, why are you asking about that? Be like, it's my meddling powers. And so again, watching for his reaction because it's pretty telling. Mm -hmm. Harry explains that he's been dreaming about that corridor and that door in specific. And he recognized it. And he thinks that Voldemort wants something from it. And that's why he's been dreaming about it. And again, Snape yells at Harry for saying the Dark Lord's name. Oh, quit being a bitch. Right. <laughs> but also tells him there's a lot of things in the Department of Mysteries, but none of them concern you, which bald faced lie right there, dude. Right. Not that Harry knows that at this point, but none of them concern you. One of them literally concerns him. Literally? Literally. Literally, not literally? Literally. Okay. I literally love you. <laughs> but like I said, at this point, this has completely ended it. Between feeling the emotion himself from witnessing Cedric's death mm -hmm. and Harry starting to meddle in things that he cannot answer, he's just like, yeah, we're done for tonight, but you're going to come back on Wednesday. So forget it being a once a week lesson thing. He's now like, come back in two days. Yeah. We'll continue this work then. He's like, you get one day break. And then I'm going to fuck you up all over again, sir. Tells him to rid his mind of all emotion every night before sleep, which, again, <laughs> easier said than done. And warns him that he'll know if he doesn't practice. Which he will. I mean, yeah, he, sure. It's accurate. So Harry's just like, yeah, 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 whatever. And he grabs his bag and starts to leave. And he looks back just to see Snape retrieving his thoughts from the pensive. And then closes the door and his scar is just throbbing. Fun. He almost feels kind of like how he did after he had the dream of Mr. Weasley. Mm -hmm. Like it really affected him. He remembers that Hermione told him that they were going to be in the library. So he heads there to find them and just sits down by them feeling almost feverish at this point. Yeah. Hermione first asks how the lesson went, but then really sees what he looks like and wants to know instead if he's all right, which, of course, Harry just says fine, because that's what he does. He's a boy, and he's Harry, and He's yeah. more concerned with realizing what he realized about the Department of Mysteries than he is about how he actually feels at this moment. Yeah. Meanwhile, in the movie, he looks and feels just like he did after he had that dream with Arthur, because it was... After he had that dream with Arthur. Right. <laughs> About that. <laughs> but anyway, he fills them in on the whole department of mystery thing. And Ron wonders if the thing you know who was after is at the Ministry of Magic, which Harry thinks that it's got to be. 
And Hermione also thinks this seems pretty logical because Sturgis Podmore was trying to get through a door at the ministry when mm-hmm. he was arrested. Yeah. Context clues. Right. But that makes Ron wonder why he would be trying to break through that door if he was supposedly on their side and Hermione's not sure. So Harry just asks Ron if his dad's ever mentioned anything about the Department of Mysteries. Mm -hmm. And literally all Ron knows is that the people who work there are called unspeakables. That's pretty badass. Right. Ron thinks that it's a weird place to hide a weapon. But I think that's just an indication of Ron also not being near qualified enough to be in Ravenclaw. Right? Because as Hermione points out, it makes perfect sense. It actually could be something top secret that the ministry is developing. And hello, it's literally called the Department of Mysteries. How is it weird to hide a top secret weapon in a Department of Mysteries? (laughs) That feels like the exact perfect place. Right? Like, you have a mystery... You put it in the Department of Mystery. What? I don't understand how Ron doesn't catch that. Whatever. Yeah. It's because he speaks without thinking. He does. And Hermione, being the only one with any real sense, again asks Harry if he's sure he's all right. Gets another fine. And a little bit of an elaboration where he just says he doesn't like Occlumency much. Well, that's an understatement. Right. But Hermione thinks it's understandable that he feels shaky after having his mind repeatedly attacked and she thinks they should go back to Gryffindor common room because they'll be more comfortable there which ends up not being the case because when they get back to said common room Fred and George are demonstrating their latest invention otherwise known as the headless hat and it's this amazing production of Fred putting on a pointed hat with a fluffy pink feather Okay. And for a second, he just stands there looking really stupid, but then the hat and his head just disappear. And it's just a headless body standing there. And fuck you, Order of the Phoenix movie, for not giving us a glimpse of this. Right? You mean to tell me that we got, in Sorcerer's Stone, Harry putting on an invisibility cloak and going, My body's gone! But we didn't get this. We didn't get a disembodied voice saying, my head is gone. Exactly. What? Come on. I would like to sue you for negligence, WB. But it's definitely quite the distraction because girls are literally screaming in reaction and other people are just cracking up. And it's very noisy and very disruptive. And Hermione can't even focus on her work because she actually finds the magic that they were able to do to invent this to be very clever right though she does comment that she doesn't think that the charm would last all that long i don't think it needs to right for a joke hat it's literally a hat trick (laughs) (laughs) anyway hermione is commenting on the cleverness of this charm and harry doesn't really have anything to say because he just feels sick And ends up ultimately deciding he's just going to do his work the next day Mm -hmm. and go to bed. But Hermione says, oh, write it in your planner. The one she got him for Christmas. Write it in your planner so you don't forget. And just to humor (laughs) her, he pulls out this book, turns into the page that has the date on it, and starts scribbling the information about Pepto Bitch Mall's assignment. And as he's doing so, the book says the whole, don't leave it till later, you big second raider. (laughs) <laughs> oh god i would punch that book in the face i don't think it has a face i you know what i would draw a face on it, and punch it. <laughs> perfect <laughs> but he puts it away crosses the room has to dodge george who tries to put the headless hat on him which would have been the perfect opportunity for him to my head is gone but whatever exactly i'm saying <laughs> He's not feeling up to that kind of shenanigans at the moment. So he just dodges him, gets to the stairwell, heads up to his dorm, and barely makes it before he's hit with this wave of pain that's so extreme, he collapses. That can't be good. And he can hear this maniacal laughter ringing in his ears and feels happier than he's ever felt, like ever. I don't like that. Through all of this, he can hear somebody yelling his name and that crazy laughter 
gets interrupted by a cry of pain, which, as it turns out, was someone hitting him across the face. And he kind of comes to to realize that he is, in fact, the one laughing. Oh, that's freaky as fuck. Can you believe we did not get this? That's, oh. Could you imagine Daniel Radcliffe doing that, though? Oh. He's really good at weird, creepy stuff. Yes. He would have been awesome at that. That would have been the creepiest thing ever, and I would have lived for it. Right. But he comes to, and he's lying on the floor. Ron's leaning over him, looking really concerned, understandably. His best friend was just laughing like a freaking maniac. Well, yeah. He wants to know what happened, and Harry manages to sit up, saying he doesn't really know, but he's really, really happy. Mm -hmm. And Ron's like, you mean you know who? And Harry says, yes, something good has happened. And it's something that he has been hoping for. I'm sorry, but literally as you were talking, all I started imagining was the only time we've ever heard Voldemort laugh in the movies, which was that weird. (laughs) And now I'm just picturing Daniel Daniel Radcliffe Radcliffe doing that. Daniel Radcliffe imitating that. (laughs) With like a random ow (laughs) in between. Oh my god. Why didn't we get this? (laughs) Ow. (laughs) Ow. (laughs) <laughs> yes god damn it why don't we have this in our lives we do now we just did it oh my god that you're was welcome inc- to everyone listening to us that was incredible <laughs> ow <laughs> but yeah so something good has happened something he's been hoping for and harry is saying this as if somebody else is speaking through his mouth He's not thinking about these words. They're just pouring out. Word vomit. But as they're coming out of his mouth, he knows without a doubt that they're right. He knows that Moldy Voldy is super fucking happy about something. That's just scary. For a number of reasons. He's taken some deep breaths, trying not to vomit on Ron like he did last time because he feels, like I said before, exactly like he did after the snake dream. Yeah. This time he's very grateful that Seamus and Dean aren't there watching all of this happen too. Because that's oh, the God. last thing he needs. I say that's all he fucking needs right now. Or Neville, for that matter. Well, Neville wasn't really watching the last time either because he immediately went to go get McGonagall. Well, just to have anybody there. Yeah. I, th- I feel like, aside from Ron, because Ron is Ron. And Ron tells Harry that he came up to check on him per Hermione's suggestion because, again, she's the only one with any actual sense. And right. she knew that his mind was likely to be really vulnerable after the Occlumency lesson. Mm -hmm. And he adds on that he supposes it'll be helpful in the long run, but he doesn't even look like he believes this as he's saying it. Yeah. He's just like, yeah, I'm sure that this is going to be a good thing ultimately, (laughs) but maybe you should just go to bed now. But right now, this sucks ass. Harry seems to kind of agree with him because he feels like his mind is weaker rather than stronger. Mm -hmm. which you know it probably is and i don't know if that's just because it was attacked so many times or because he's just really doing such a shitty job clearing out emotion i mean again it's not like he was really given instruction on how to do that very well so but also now he's really concerned what was it that happened that made voldemort so happy that would definitely be my next thought for sure And let's be honest, Harry and his meddling addiction, we're going to go with addiction. (laughs) Yes, sounds sounds about right. He's never going to be able to close his mind. Mm Mm-mm. He's too curious. Yeah, he's way too fucking curious. Mm Mm-mm. And he's never going to be able to because he ultimately doesn't want to. Yeah. If he actually wanted to close his mind, I bet he could do it easily. Oh, for sure. But his curiosity and his meddling addiction are 100% the thing that will prevent him from ever being able to because he doesn't fucking want to. Here's the thing. When he was able to repel the Imperius curse, that was very one-sided. Someone else is controlling you. With this, there's a link. So he can see into Voldemort's shit, and Voldemort and can see into his shit. he doesn't want to give shit. that up because meddling addiction. Exactly. If it was just one-sided and it was just Voldemort seeing into his mind and that's all it was, 
I feel like he would be a lot more apt Concerned. to try. <laughs> yeah, a lot more apt to try harder at controlling it. But because there's the link the other way, he's like, oh, but I kind of like this because it's a thing. I can see into his mind. And then on top of that, Harry is stubborn as fuck. Well, yeah. And the Imperious Curse was actually controlling him and making him do something he didn't want to do. Yeah. And because he's so stubborn, it's almost ingrained in him to just, why would I do that? I don't want to fucking do that. Yeah. And it's not the same controlling thing. No. It's more subtle. So it doesn't activate his stubborn powers as much from that angle. It's kind of how, like, when Snape was doing Legilimens on Harry... Harry didn't really fight back until he got to the part that Harry was like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want you seeing that. This is that. private. You don't get to see Yeah, this. I don't want you seeing that. Don't you? What the fuck are you doing in there? Get out. He may have the strength to do it, but he does not have the motivation. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he has the willpower to fight off his meddling tendencies. Like I said, addiction. Yeah. But that'll bring us to the end of the book chapter. And as we've been done with the movie section for quite a while now, we didn't have any new actors because it was just Snape and Harry and we've talked about them before. So, yep, very basic. Yeah. So let's move right on to the Potter pondering, which is what do you think about the movie putting Harry's first occlumency lesson before the holidays instead of after like in the book? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. Or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. Don't forget, you can also stitch your response on TikTok. And I know I've been saying that every week and we haven't made a TikTok video in a while, but I promise you there will be one this week. You guys can blame me. It's been a really, really shitty month. <laughs> but we really looked forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. This will bring us to our Sorting Hat story, which is from Michael Slater. He writes, Hello, my name is Michael. My house is Ravenclaw, and my Patronus is a badger. My wand is maple with a unicorn hair core, 12 inches with slightly springy flexibility. My story is very similar to one you've already heard, as my twin sister is a devoted follower of the podcast. When we had our ninth birthday, the Harry Potter books Prisoner of Azkaban and Chamber of Secrets were given to us as gifts. Our family was big into reading every night, so we weren't disappointed with unfamiliar books. After reading Chamber of Secrets, we decided we loved the series and our parents got the Sorcerer's Stone. We were hooked after that and eagerly awaited each new installment. Often, I would get frustrated with my family's slow reading pace and steal the book for myself and read ahead when I should have been sleeping. As we got older, our family reading time faded away, but we all continued to read the books as they came out. Harry Potter has a special place in my family, and it has been able to bring me closer to friends and acquaintances as it has for so many others. Thank you so much for sharing your Sorting Hat story with us, Michael. Yes! If you are anything like your twin sister, Megan, then you have got to be equally awesome. Megan is pretty fucking awesome. I would say so. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your Sorting Hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. Or you can message it to us over social media. This week's trivia question is, who was convicted for murdering Gideon and Fabian Pruitt? The first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word hashtag brutal will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com to let us know you did and we will get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at foxsakepod. Following us on Podbean at foxsakepod.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at forfoxsakepodcast.com to check out our For Fox Sake and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. 
Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, vlogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you would like to support us as a patron, you can sign up on patreon.com slash foxsakepod. $2 and up a month will get you some awesome perks like for Fox Sake swag, access to patron-only Facebook groups, chats, our Discord channel, virtual hangouts, and more. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated, even if it's just telling your Harry Potter friends about us. And if you don't have any Harry Potter friends, there's another reason to join our Patreon, because you will meet some of the best Harry Potter people ever. I mean, just the best people ever, really. There's that too. Period. End of sentence. And join us next week when we talk about the first half of Chapter 25, The Beetle at Bay, and the film scenes that correspond with a tiny portion of the chapter. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. And in the meantime... Keep calm and Harry on! Oh, for fuck's sake.